sans plus attendre, Québec Océan est très heureux aujourd'hui d'accueillir Yann Rick. Euh, Yann a étudié la physique du climat à la Christian Albrecht Universität de Kiel, euh, excuse pour mon, pour mon allemand, et euh, a terminé son doctorat en océanographie physique sous la direction de Klaus Bonning au Géomar en 2019. Après avoir étudié les tourbillons à méso-échelle et leur variabilité dans les modèles de circulation générale des océans pendant son doctorat, il a commencé à étudier l'impact des tourbillons sur les flux air-mer, en particulier le CO2, pendant son premier postdoc au Géomar sous la supervision de Lavinia Patara. Actuellement, Yann se trouve à l'Université McGill où il a continué ses recherches sur les tourbillons avec Carolina Dufour, qui a commencé son postdoctorat en 2020, et il s'intéresse actuellement aux interactions entre les tourbillons de méso-échelle et la glace de mer. Donc Yann, je t'invite à partager ton écran et je te laisse la place. Thank you for the introduction. Yes, so I will talk about Southern Ocean mesoscale eddies uh, today. It's a bit of a broad topic, but I will try to uh, Um, focus a bit on two aspects. The one, the impact and uptake uh, on the uptake and transport of CO2, which I worked on at uh, Geoma with Lavinia Patara. And then after that, uh, I'll talk a little bit about the, the interaction of mesoscale eddies in the Southern Ocean with the sea ice, which is a topic I'm working on right now with uh, Carolina before here at McGill. And uh, both of these uh, will be rather short introductions into the topic because the, they are, um, there's a lot of technical issues like the model development and so on uh, involved so far in both of these projects. Not so many results, but a lot of interesting questions in the end. So first, as I assume most of you are more familiar with uh, the Arctic and the Northern Oceans. I'm going to give a short introduction into the Southern Ocean. So what is special about the Southern Ocean? As we can see on this image here on this map, there's no limits, which means basically if you, there's some latitudes, you can just go around uh, all the South Pole, the Antarctic continent without encountering any, any land boundaries. And this uh, is true for the ocean and also for the atmosphere. So this leads to the fact that there's strong zonal winds all uh, around the pole in the Southern Ocean, and they drive uh, also vigorous currents. In particular, the Antarctic uh, circumpolar current, the ACC, which circumvents uh, all, the, all the globe around Antarctica. Now, additionally to this uh, horizontal circulation, The Southern Ocean is also kind of the other end of the meridional overturning circulation. So probably all of you have heard of the meridional overturning circulation, especially here in the, in the Northern uh, Atlantic, mostly, uh, where we have deep convection and the formation of deep waters that are then uh, um, exported towards the equator and uh, the upper branch, the warm waters transported towards the pole and so on. And the Southern Ocean is basically the other end of this. So as we can see on the schematic here, we have uh, the deep waters that are found in the, in the Northern uh, Oceans that upwell again here near the Antarctic continent due to the, the wind at the surface and are then either uh, transported towards the north uh, near the surface or in the intermediate layer, the so-called intermediate waters, or they form the bottom waters that then spread out near the bottom all over the ocean. And all this is, is possible through the intense air sea fluxes uh, and the strong winds above the, the Southern Ocean. So we see that the Southern Ocean is really a very important area of the global ocean for the overturning circulation. Now, as we can imagine such a strong current like the Antarctic circumpolar current that goes around the Antarctica also uh, is full of eddies. So strong currents usually lead to instabilities which generate eddies and uh, 
other uh, mesoscale features. And we can see here in this uh, image uh, produced from um, satellite altimetry observations of the sea surface height, basically, that are then uh, calculated, or one can calculate the, the surface velocities. And we can see here that there's a lot of eddies, a lot of small meanders and uh, things uh, in the Southern Ocean, especially in the region of the, of the ACC. And uh, within the ACC, especially near topography. The topography is not really shown on this image, but uh, you just have to believe me that everywhere in these areas here, for example, south of New Zealand or here in the uh, south of the Indian Ocean, there's a um, mid ocean ridges or um, islands and uh, topography that especially leads to uh, um, the formation of a lot of eddies. So what do these eddies do in the Southern Ocean? They do a lot of things, and among them is heat transport. So eddies transport heat forward, which uh, is analogously to the um, atmosphere, where in the mid-latitudes, um, the storm systems play an important role in, in heat transport towards the poles. And uh, similarly, in, in, in the ocean, as we can see here from this uh, study by uh, Sung et al. from Two years ago, um, this figure shows the depth integrated meridional eddy heat transport calculated from uh, Argo data that is uh, co located with, uh, with the eddies from, from satellite altimetry that have been observed from satellite altimetry. Um, and we can see that in the Southern Ocean, there's a lot of blue, blue meaning heat transport towards. This is south, so from the equator towards uh, the pole, the Antarctic continent. And also, we can see again that these hotspots of heat transport are again in these uh, regions where there's topography, as I pointed out before, in the middle of the Indian Ocean sector here in south of Australia and New Zealand and so on. So the eddies really play an important role in, in the in heat transport uh, towards the pole in the Southern Ocean as well. Um, the second role that the eddies play is the so-called eddy compensation. So eddy compensation is, the, is a, uh, a theory of, of uh, how the eddies impact the mean current, especially in, in, the, in the Southern Ocean due to the Ar uh, Antarctic uh, circumpolar current and the winds above. So basically, what eddy compensation is, if we look at the schematic, on the left panel, we see like the mean, the normal state. We have a wind forcing on the top, this uh, red arrow pointing towards us. And this uh, wind forcing leads to an Ekman transport that is towards the right in the schematic. So um, uh, it uh, leads to a steepening of the isopycnal. So the isopycnal in this schematic is this black diagonal line. And the Ekman transport towards the right leads to a steepening of the isopycnals by transporting water here towards the right on the surface. Because of this uh, sloped isopycnal, we have a thermal wind transport in the ocean. So we have a ocean current due to the density difference between here and here at the same depth, we have different densities because the other equipments are sloping. And this uh, current can develop instabilities and eddies. And these eddies, it, the integrated effect of the eddies is, is to flatten these other equipments. So the eddies will try to move water towards the left on, on top and towards the uh, right on, uh, at the bottom. And there's, uh, in the mean state, there's a balance between this wind forcing and the eddies that keeps the isopropanol at the same slope in the same position. Now, the eddy compensation uh, mechanism happens when uh, we have uh, stronger wind forcing, for example, stronger, um, as indicated here by this bigger red arrow pointing towards us, which uh, results in stronger Ekman transport, which would result in the steepening of the, of the isopropanol. But because the steepening of the isopycnal also means more uh, thermal wind transport and the uh, increase of the, of the horizontal current, which leads to more instabilities and more eddies, 
in the end, we also have more eddies that flatten the other pipnose again, and uh, nothing happens. The other pipnose stays uh, has the same slope. The current in the ocean has the same strength. So this uh, means that the ocean circulation, at least the, the, this uh, zonal current in the in the southern ocean, is relatively uh, insensitive to the wind forcing. We can make the wind stronger or weaker. The, the current here stays the same due to this eddy compensation. So this is a very important role of the eddies as well. And then the third role of the eddies I want to introduce is um, the eddies role in ventilation, which brings us slowly into the direction of the first uh, topic of the talk. Um, so ventilation of the ocean basically is... Um, when the deep ocean receives water from the surface ocean. So ventilation means I get new water into, into the ocean, which usually has more oxygen, for example, and also other um, tracer um, properties that are set at the surface. And then we need, some, we need to export this water from the surface layer to the deep ocean. That's ventilation. The, on the right here, we see... Uh, the transport of carbon, as an example, uh, out of the surface layer by different processes. So this is uh, calculated from Argo data um, in a study by uh, Saleh and co-authors from 2012. And they um, decompose this uh, ventilation, this subduction of carbon um, into different parts. And here we show the Ekman part on the upper left the mean flow, the part uh, achieved by the mean flow on the upper right, the eddies on the lower left, and then the combined total um, subduction on the lower right. And we can see, without going too much into the details, that the eddies um, are responsible for a ventilation or for a subduction of carbon uh, roughly on the same order of magnitude as the, as the mean flow. So they are contributed quite significantly to, to this uh, subduction to the ventilation of, of the deep ocean. And this subduction of carbon also brings me to the first uh, part of the talk, um, the eddies and the, and the CO2, so the interaction of or the impact of the eddies on the CO2. Now, we've seen before that they, they, the eddies can transport carbon and can contribute significantly to the subduction of carbon. Uh, but in this study, the focus is more on the uh, air-sea CO2 fluxes. So in this image here, I show the um, air-sea CO2 flux uh, from the model, from the ocean uh, biogeochemistry model, from a random uh, snapshot. Um, it's just to illustrate that just by looking at it, you already see there's a lot of eddies, and inside the eddies, often the CO2 flux is different from the surroundings. So, in general, here we see a negative means there's a flux of CO2 out of the ocean, and positive means uh, the blue colors, uh, it's into the ocean. So we see, for example, here we have an eddy that is uh, where we outgas CO2 to the atmosphere, in a region where around these, this eddy, the ocean takes up CO2 from the atmosphere. So there's clearly some, some impact on this, um, uh, on this CO2 flux by the eddies. Um, so the method I'm going to use to look at this, I mean, I cannot just look at this, these beautiful images and say eddies uh, impact this air seed CO2 flux, uh, we need to quantify this a bit more. So I, uh, I need some uh, method to do that. And I choose to track and detect the eddies to have a more uh, in-depth view of what actually happens in the eddies. And I'm going to introduce this uh, eddy detection and, and, uh, and tracking a little bit. because it's also um, the method for the second part of the study. So it's uh, quite an, uh, uh, the, the talk is quite an important method for my work right now. Um, 
Um, so the eddy detection I used is based on the Kurbovice parameter, uh, OW. And uh, basically what the Kurbovice parameter is, it's a measure of, of uh, a metric of the flow field. So you can take the velocity, which we can see here on the left, and just the, the, the absolute velocity, and we decompose this velocity into the strain in the middle and the vorticity on the right. So the strain basically is a measure of how the flow field would stretch a, a parcel of water, while the vorticity is a measure of how the flow field um, would rotate a parcel of water. So we decompose the velocity field into the strain and the vorticity part, and then we subtract the vorticity from the strain, which is our Okubu vice product. As you can see here, then on the right, blue is negative, red is positive. And you can see this eddy that we have seen on all these pictures in the middle is very blue. So that's the nature of the Okubu vice parameter. It's negative whenever vorticity dominates over strain. So when rotational uh, velocities dominate over the strain uh, impacted velocities, which means that this is the eddy. And then you can also see there's a lot of small things, but usually what you do, you set a threshold. Um, for example, here we say a threshold is minus 0 0.05, and then everything below the threshold. So when the vorticity is uh, dominates the strain by a certain amount and not just marginally, we say this is an eddy. And then also we uh, we do uh, implement some further limitations on size and so on. So we say all these very small things here, we just got that. It's not the, the eddies we want to look at. It might just be some uh, smaller, maybe even numerical instabilities. So once we detected the eddies, I do this at every, every time step of my, of, my, of my data. It could be um, velocity from observations, from satellite atomicity, for example, or it could, could be from models. Basically, you just need a velocity field. Um, so I do this for every time step of my data, and then I track the eddies. Here in this uh, plot, again, I show the, these, the Sukubu vice parameter for consecutive time steps. And at every time step, I detect the eddy. And then I look at the next time step, and I look for similar eddies nearby. So in this case, I found one that uh, is added then towards the, to the first and we have a track. And I repeat this until there's no, no similar eddy found uh, nearby my current eddy. And then I have a track of the eddy and I can see where it moves, uh, where it was generated and where it uh, disappears. And from this track, I can then create for every time step for every eddy a mask, zeros and ones like shown here on the left. This mask I can then multiply with any uh, any variable, basically. In this case, it's from model output, so I have a lot of variables to choose from. Um, I multiply this, for example, here with the temperature, and then I get the temperature inside the ID. And I can do this with uh, all the variables that I output from the model. And then I do this for all my eddies at all the time steps. Um, then I get this. Uh, now here we, we have a depth on the y-axis and the zonal coordinate on the on the x-axis. And for every eddy at every time step, I get something like this. I get a section through the eddy over depth and uh, and the x axis uh, the x-coordinate. And you can see that they are all different sizes, of course. Every eddies don't all have the the same uh, the same size. So what I do is I just say, okay, the eddy edge is always minus one on the in the west and uh, plus one on the in the east, and I interpolate them all onto the standard eddy radius uh, coordinate system, and then in the end I get an average eddy, which uh, goes from minus one to one in the in the radius coordinate system, and then has the depth and the uh, coordinate and uh, the variable which uh, I used for the extraction, and this I can do for all the different eddies uh, at every time step. And uh, for all different variables, I can do it for different eddies uh, of different sizes or different uh, 
rotation for cyclonic and anticyclonic eddies, and so on. So this is uh, was the method, the eddy detection method. So we will now go into the first uh, results kind of section, um, which is on the eddies impact on air sea uh, fluxes of CO2 and the uptake of CO2 by the ocean. And this was done at the uh, Geoma in Germany with Lavinia Patara, and we uh, used the Orion 10 MOPS model uh, system. So Orion 10 is uh, the ocean uh, sea ice component, which is composed of Nemo and uh, LIM2, the French models for ocean and sea ice. And it has a global, it's a global model with a res resolution of half a degree. And in the Southern Ocean, we have a refinement to a resolution of one tenth of a degree. So it's a, uh, it has eddies. It's not uh, completely eddy resolving, but it has eddies. Um, and here in this uh, schematic, you can see the the, the strategy we we um, we used to spin up this model. So we start from the climatological initial conditions, and then repeat our atmospheric forcing. This is a JIA uh, forcing from Japan. Um, we repeat this for several cycles to spin up the model. And then at some point, we start to increase CO2 in the atmosphere to uh, get the anthropogenic uh, signal in the CO2. And then we do this with the half, of degree, half a degree model to save computational resources. And then at some point, we... Uh, we spin off from this the quarter of a degree model and also the, the version with the tenth of a degree uh, refined region in the Southern Ocean. And all this is done with also a biogeochemistry inside the model with carbon. It's an intermediate complexity biogeochemical model, so it's not very, very complex. It has nine tracers, but it has carbon also added. And this is a snapshot of uh, the velocity of this model. And you can see the, the black contours here um, showing the domain of the region or the region where the uh, horizontal resolution is refined to a tenth of a degree. You can see this, this uh, encompasses the, the ACC region. And uh, due to technical issues, there's a small gap here, but uh, um, Generally, this is uh, the model name domain. And for the results I will show, I just used this region here in this uh, south of Australia and New Zealand because otherwise uh, I would have to detect and track too many eddies. But I, I repeated that for other regions, and it's basically the general conclusions are the same. So with this eddy detection and the tracking that I showed before, I tracked all the cyclones and anticyclones in, in south of Australia and uh, New Zealand, and uh, uh, computed the, the mean temperature within the eddies and outside the eddies. So for every eddy, I look also in the surroundings of the eddy, how, what are the properties of the ocean there, to calculate the anomalies of the eddy towards uh, its surroundings. And you can see here on the left is always the cyclones, on the right the anticyclones. Here, the green line is the, the temperature profile outside the eddy, depth here on the y-axis and the temperature on the x-axis. And the blue dashed line is uh, the temperature within the eddies. And we can see the expected the cyclones are cold core eddies. So they have a cold anomaly. And the anticyclones have a warm anomaly. They are warm core eddies. Now, for the DIC, which is dissolved inorganic carbon, which is our measure in the model of, of, of carbon in the ocean, um, it's shown here in the contours. The, the colors again are the temperature. We just to give a more 2D view, but it's basically what I said before, cold and warm. And then the carbon, we see that the cold core cyclones are associated with a positive anomaly in carbon, and the anticyclones have a negative anomaly in carbon. Now, that's not very surprising because the, the general meridional gradient of temperature in the, in the Southern Ocean is cold in the south and warm in the north. And the general um, meridional gradient of, of uh, carbon of the IC is uh, 
um, higher in the in the south and, and lower in the north. So the eddies that are colder in the core that usually generate from regions that are colder, so further south, usually also have uh, higher values of, of DIC in their core. And then uh, to look at the CO2 flux and the exchange of the atmosphere, we look at the, these two lines here on top, um, where we can see that the orange line is the CO2 flux. There's an anomaly again. There's a negative anomaly. So because we have more CO2 in the cyclone compared to its surroundings, it takes up less CO2 from the atmosphere compared to its surroundings. And it takes up more heat because it has a cold uh, anomaly, which is shown by the blue line. And the opposite is true for the cyclones, uh, for the anticyclones. So that's basically what is expected. And then what I did further is to um, take the center of the eddies um, and look at uh, the evolution of the properties at the center for every time step in the model. And then we get these uh, plots here, which are again on the left, the cyclones, on the right, the anticyclones. And on top, we have temperature. And on the bottom row, we have the DIC. And now again here, it's the depth on the y-axis. And on the x-axis, as I said, it's the time. So it's at each time step, the values at the center of the eddy. And we can see that if we focus first on the mixed layer, at the, on the surface layer, because this is the layer that interacts with the atmosphere and that can change the fluxes, we see that uh, the anomalies get uh, lower with time, which is not surprising. Um, but we can see that uh, the cyclones, uh, we have an increased heat flux from the atmosphere, which reduces this cold anomaly. We have a decreased um, CO2 flux from the atmosphere, which uh, also reduces the anomaly of more uh, DIC in the ocean, and the opposite for the anticyclones. So that's not very surprising. But then there, we can see that there's some interesting features. For example, here near the mixed layer um, uh, depth, uh, the, the bottom of the mixed layer, there's some uh, interesting things going on. And uh, also, we see that the uh, anomalies at depth are also getting smaller. So there needs to be, there has to be some exchange with the surrounding ocean to, to spread the, or to, to dissipate this anomaly. And this seems to be more efficient in the cyclones than the anticyclones. And this is uh, something I did not look into, but it's an interesting fact that, uh, yeah, should be studied further. And that has already been the part one. In this uh, work, we used an eddy permitting ocean sea ice biogeochemistry simulation of the Southern Ocean, and uh, I detected, tracked, and averaged the uh, eddies to create composites and uh, found that the uh, eddies indeed trap and uh, transport the carbon and affecting the fluxes across the air sea interface. So then we'll come to the next part, which is somehow related, but looks at a different. Uh, Impact. So it uh, looks at the mesoscale eddies and their impact on the on the sea ice and their interactions with the sea ice. We can see here in this image um, the sea ice, uh, or it's a picture taken from satellite of the Southern Ocean. And we can see here in the north there's clouds. Then we have the dark areas here, which is the, the Southern Ocean, and we see sea ice, which. Um, has some some swirls and uh, filaments and so on, which indicates that it moves actually with uh, the ocean currents. And that's a known known uh, known fact that uh, in areas with low sea ice concentration, eddies actually take the sea ice and move it uh, with them, and you can clearly see their their interaction. Um, now, the project I'm working on asks the question. What happens in the areas with the high sea ice concentration, the pack ice, where we don't we don't even see the ocean? It's just ice. So what uh, it's not well studied because obviously it's hard to observe the ocean beneath the, the pack ice, and uh, also hard to model because usually 
uh, always <laughs> pack ice regions are at very high latitudes where you need a uh, very high horizontal resolution to to simulate uh, the ocean and uh, the eddies. Um, so there's some uh, studies and, and ideas about what happens, uh, what are the interactions between mesoscale eddies and sea ice. So the first one by Minigello and co-authors from uh, this year, basically they found in observations from the mooring uh, below the sea ice that uh, the sea ice induces stress that dissipates eddies, which is uh, kind of obvious. I mean, you have a more or less solid uh, thing on top of the ocean, and the eddies move below it. There's friction between the water and the ice, and this uh, dissipates in the end uh, the eddies. But the same stress between the, the ocean and, and, the, and the eddies, this friction, also can lead to, to vertical velocities um, similar to, to wind stress curl at the, uh, that leads to Ekman pumping and Ekman suction. Um, in a study by uh, Gupta and co-authors from last year, they found that the sea ice, the solid sea ice and the rotation of the eddy below also creates this Ekman pumping, which uh, they postulate uh, leads to upwelling of warmer waters in anticyclones that melts the sea ice and uh, convergence or uh, of uh, waters, of cold waters in the cyclones that leads to positive anomalies in, in, in the sea ice uh, thickness and, and uh, concentration. Um, so the, the project basically aims at looking into that in a bit uh, more detail and uh, see to, to resolve a bit this uh, uh, discrepancy between the sea ice, uh, the stress that dissipates the eddies, but at the same time, it also leads to an interaction between the eddies and the sea ice. So the question is uh, how strong this interaction can be before the eddies are dissipated, I guess. Um, and to look into this, I use the MIT uh, general circulation model in a configuration of a reentrant channel, which basically means you can see it here. It's a, a shelf here on the left. The domain is uh, about 3,000 kilometers in the X direction and 2,500 in the Y direction. And uh, it's a re-entrant channel. That means everything that comes out towards us here gets back in on the other side. So it imitates the Southern Ocean where it just goes around and around infinitely. And uh, I force it with a climatological forcing of uh, Euro 5 for 200 uh, or more years. Uh, just to spin it up, and then we see uh, we get a temperature distribution shown here in the blue, orange, purple colors. Um, where we have, uh, if you take the temperature for now as a as a proxy for the density, we have as upward sloping other signals like we should have in the Southern Ocean, and then we can see here in the white to blue colors the sea ice on the top, and in the green and the red the vorticity indicative of uh, eddies. So we see that there's some eddies uh, here in the north of the sea ice, but also some features uh, under the sea ice, which are not so well visible because they're under the sea ice, but they are there. And uh, the questions I want to address in this project basically are, where do the eddies come from? They could originate from further north where there's no sea ice and propagate under the sea ice or they could be generated under the sea ice themselves. Uh, I also want to look at where do they go? Do they, are they able to propagate a long way under the sea ice or are they dissipated really quickly? And also what happens on the way? How do they interact with the sea ice? Uh, uh, how do they impact the sea ice? So I do this uh, then again with the method of detection and tracking of the eddies. And then I see here, for example, uh, I show one anticyclone. We see it, it has a positive uh, vorticity, so it's an anticyclone. As expected, it has a temperature in the core that is warmer than its surroundings. And uh, we can see that this warmer temperatures also lead to less sea ice friction and also less sea ice uh, thickness. So that's as expected. Anticyclones have a warm core, and because the, the water is warmer, the 
we have uh, less uh, CIs. And uh, I did this again, looking at a lot of eddies, averaging them. And uh, we have, uh, the, again, here the vertical um, axis on, on the, on the y-axis. And the, this normalized eddy radius is from minus 1 to plus 1 on the x-axis. And we see, as before, which is reassuring, um, that the anticyclone is a warm temperature anomaly. And associated with that, we see here in the middle panel the sea ice fraction in blue and the sea ice thickness anomaly in, in orange, which also both are negative. And uh, that's associated with, as we can see here on the right, uh, anomalous uh, vertical direction of heat. Um, now, the interesting thing here is uh, that this uh, vertical attraction is not uh, symmetric about the center of the of the eddy, but it's rather there's a bigger part uh, that is positive than that is negative. So that's very interesting. Um, and also for the cyclones, it is, uh, it's a bit the opposite. We have a cold core, um, but for the anomalies in sea ice fraction and sea ice thickness, we see that, um, as expected, there's a, the fraction has a positive anomaly. So we have a cold temperature anomaly in the center, and we have more sea ice. But the sea ice is not necessarily thicker. So there's a rather inconclusive anomaly in the sea ice thickness, where it's uh, thicker on one side of the area. And, uh, uh, thinner on the other side. And the vertical attraction of heat anomaly is not really as strong as in the anticyclones, but we can also see that it's uh, the opposite. So we have negative here on the left and, and uh, positive on the right, but it's not, again, not, not very strong, not so conclusive. Um, so basically, that's the first results from this study. They're not uh, um, not very conclusive yet, but uh, there's uh, definitely some things, uh, some interesting things popping up. Um, so to sum up this uh, second part, we uh, use the idealized simulation of the Southern Ocean with sea ice in this part. Uh, again, eddies, uh, I track, uh, I detect track, and then average the eddies and to investigate the impact on sea ice. And there seems to be a vertical attraction of heat that, uh, as already shown by, by, by Gupta at Al from, from last year, that this vertical attraction of heat can, can lead to less sea ice, but it does not seem to be so simple as we see in this uh, asymmetry in the, in the vertical attraction and so on. So there, I would definitely want to look into this a bit more. Um, so in this project, uh, the next step, also, or especially to 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 look into this uh, vertical uh, into this asymmetry of the vertical attraction again, um, is to increase the number of sampled eddies because for now I just look at uh, ten years of more model output. Uh, I can definitely look into more years uh, to have a bigger uh, number of samples to get better statistics on that. Also, um, I want to look. Uh, at the eddies differently. For now, I just have zonal sections through the eddies. But the, if the eddy is not symmetric, one might miss a lot of information if you just have to uh, cut one section section through it. Um, and so I I want to look into a bit more sophisticated ways of of, of averaging the eddies to to explore more of these mechanisms behind the vertical processes, and also use the tracking of the eddies um, to see where they come from and where they disappear disappear to explore a bit more the role of the lateral processes, um, whether they transport heat towards the sea ice or, or not. And uh, also increase the horizontal resolution because it's also now at 10 kilometers, which is permitting eddies in my domain, but not everywhere. And uh, definitely it's uh, just a stepping stone to going to higher horizontal resolution to get more eddies. Which brings me to my overall summary. So 
basically, to sum up everything, one could say I used eddy detection and tracking and applied it to model output. Uh, and then I uh, have two different case studies where I did that. The one is the global ocean sea ice model with biogeochemistry, and where I found that the eddies trap and transport the carbon and really influence the air sea exchange of uh, carbon. And uh, the other one is the idealized ocean sea ice model where I look at how eddies interact with the sea ice. And this uh, seems to be, for now, the temperature anomalies of the eddies and the vertical velocities that affect at least part of these uh, temperature anomalies. And yeah, that's all from me. I'm happy to take questions. OK, thank you, Jan, for your presentation. We have a question from uh, Louis Philippe. Thank you, Jan. Um, what, so, what what sets the large scale structure of uh, carbon up like in, in the figure that you showed uh, earlier? Yes. Well, it's uh, several factors. I, I think. Uh, I mean, one is the content of carbon in the ocean. So, if the ocean is uh, saturated with carbon, it cannot take up. So this, especially in, in regions where we upwell water, the up, upwelled waters usually are, are rich in carbon. And uh, so there we have uh, more outgassing. Also, the biology plays a big role. In, in regions where I have a lot of biology, I, I can uh, impact the, the cycle of carbon. Uh, and then also the temperature plays a big role. So this, uh, yeah. if the water is colder, it can take up more carbon. So that might be one of the first reasons to why why the carbon is uh, so I'm, I'm higher curious. in the south. So yeah, I I agree. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, but I'm curious, like when when they do these decomposition between the different mechanisms, how do they separate the effect of eddies uh, in in a carbon uptake? Um, you mean the, the 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 example paper I showed? The... Yeah. Yes. Yes. How did they how do they do that? Um, in this case, I guess it's not. Uh, they don't look at individual eddies. It's more like a decom uh, Reynolds decomposition of the flow into mean and deviations. So yeah. it's not really exactly comparable to uh, comparable to when I detect my eddies and look at. To, into this, uh, because there's also other deviations from the mean that they include. Into yeah, their... so I was curious: is the is the standing eddies are the standing eddies uh, included in that decomposition? Um, is it is it the deviations from the the zonal mean or from a temporal mean? I think it's temporal, but I, I'm not completely sure. Okay. So yeah, of course, if it would be zonal, there would be standing eddies that probably play a very big role in this. <laughs> um, I mean, it's, it's, it has been shown in recent years that these uh, locations um, of uh, topography interaction, or the, where the ACC interacts with topography, are really locations where there's a lot of subduction, or this is, these are the hotspots of, of ventilation, basically, in the Southern Ocean. No, but I'm just yeah, I'm just wondering if that large scale structure of of carbon uptake that uh, my my first question I guess was included in the eddy part or not. This is kind of a simple question, but I yeah, I don't know. Like if you look at at the figure that you showed earlier, I don't know, like the pretty figure. Uh, yes. Well, clearly, like the, the, there is large scale patches of uptake and uh, outgassing, and I was just wondering uh, if these large scale patches are included in the mean or or uh, are included in the it's not not this one like just yeah. <laughs> Uh, it just oh, uh, you're trying to go up, but there's a lag, I guess. Okay. Yeah, it froze. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no worries. So I'm just wondering, like, do you know if they include that in the effect of the eddies or or not? Um, I th I think it's a temporal mean, so that would mean that it's uh, 
It's not included. Okay. It's not included. This, uh, the standing eddies are not are basically part of the mean. And if you take a temporal mean at the end, the eddy is always there. It's not it's part of the mean, so it's not the eddy. Okay. Okay. So okay, can you show the the, the paper again? Like, yes. I... So I guess this, that's the one you're talking about. The... Yeah. Yes. Hmm. Okay. Yeah, I guess it's a temporal mean because you don't really see these hotspots so so well, the, the topography hotspots. So if you would take a zonal mean, probably this this uh, the areas of topography interaction would stand out more, I guess. If you if you take the um, standing meanders and eddies uh, as 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 uh, deviations from the mean, you probably would see more these uh, the regions of of uh, interaction between the ACC and topography, but I'm um, just a guess. Okay. Thank you. So we we have a question from uh, Cédric. Um, so yes, while we are on this figure, uh, I guess the contributions of eddies that are that is shown here is an average over time. It's not an instantaneous snapshot. Yes. Okay. So my question is: You show that um, cyclonic eddies were um, uh, outgassing carbon, while anticyclonic eddies were taking it in the ocean. So they kind of compensating each other. Is um, is there an asymmetry between the two, or in the number of anticyclonic versus cyclonic eddies in the different areas where the the average is either positive or negative? Yes. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, of course, if I have uh, just a positive anomaly in the one and the negative in the other, and they there's the same number and they all have the same size, in the end, I don't have anything. Um, and to that, I'm. It, I mean, there's different uh, things that theoretically should contribute to to this. I didn't find any any real conclusions yet, but one is that. Uh, for this, there is uh, an asymmetry of anticyclones and cyclones sometimes. I mean, it's a bit difficult. So in in my idealized model, there's a clear asymmetry, but that's maybe not uh, not um, not real, or it depends on where you look. But in general, if you have a current, you tend to produce anticyclones on the one side and the cyclones on the other side because it's just like. You, you the current meanders around and then you create a at least that on the one side that rotate in the in the one direction and then they rotate in the other direction on the other side so there is a, at least in some regions a, a symmetry between how many cyclones I have and how many anticyclones I have um, and there also is in on average uh, a symmetry in the propagation of uh, of the eddies so Cyclones tend to propagate, but slightly towards uh, the pole, and anticyclones slightly towards the the equator. Um, on top of their general propagation towards the west, um, so that could also, if you generate eddies just in one spot, their slightly different mean directions of propagation could lead to more positive anomalies of, of carbon being transported to the one direction and more negative being transported towards the other direction. But um, I did not really look into that so much. So I couldn't say like where would this plays a role or may not, where, where they compensate each other, the eddies, and where they actually have a big impact, like in, in, in the mean. Um, I, hope, yeah. I hope I kind of answered your question. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, and I, I think it makes sense um, noticing where the positive and negative anomalies show up. It's on uh, each side of the ACC, so that makes sense, given yes. what you, you said. Um, can I ask another question on the other part? Yeah, sure. Um, so the, regarding the interaction with CIs, uh, you showed that there was an asymmetry. Um, between one side of the eddy and the other one. I guess uh, one side was west and the other one was east. Is that right? Yes. I, have uh, you looked if there is a north-south asymmetry as well? Um, 
Not yet. I'm, I'm looking into that now. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm not now, but <laughs> in these days, um, because um, yeah, I mean, this uh, these are just zonal sections to the eddy, so it's not really as long as the eddy is completely symmetric. That's perfectly fine to look at it in this way, because no matter how you rotate your section, it will always look the same. But we can see here that the eddy is not uh, perfectly symmetric. So there, there is some two-dimensional structure or some horizontal two-dimensional structure in the eddy, which I can, of, of course, not completely uh, capture with my, my section that I just cut through it. So now that is one thing I'm, I'm doing now to look into it in different ways. Um, in different orientations, or also as a 2D, uh, 2D horizontal average, to see how how this asymmetry looks in, in in the horizontal space, to to maybe also understand better what happens there. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, we have a question online. So can yes. you can you yes, read the I question and answer it, please? Yes. So the question is by uh, Yichan. Uh, in part two, could the asymmetries be, be due to the counterclockwise flow around anticyclone, bringing warmer water and air from the north on the western side and colder water and air from the south to the eastern side and the opposite around the cyclone? Um, yes, I mean, of course, we see in this one not so, uh, this in this eddy not so much, but of course you see uh, that the eddies um, transport water from one direction also around their around their edges. So the count the, the flow of the anticyclone definitely um, usually brings more cold water on the on the on the right on the um, on the eastern side towards the north because it flows around like this. So um, clearly this can affect uh, cold water and also sea ice, if there's sea ice and so on. Um, so in, in this uh, 2D kind of sense, yeah, sure, there, there's definitely some anomalies that are associated with the advection induced by the eddy. Um, yes, I hope that was the, the asymmetry you were talking about and not this one, because this one is looking into the vertical advection um so the the horizontal transport from the north and the south should not play too big a role in this uh we have a question online from uh, daniel Bourgou. could you uh, put there's something i don't quite understand it and i think it relates to what we philip was asking earlier and i'm not sure i understood everything can you put back the uh, slide uh, number six <laughs> Okay, I, I just want to make sure I understand what, what is meant by an eddy in this study. And uh, so if we look at the uh, eddies, the third panel that shows the eddy contribution from the eddies, I think I understood you said earlier, this probably comes from some sort of Reynolds decomposition of, of the signal. Is that yes. correct? Okay. Then in a turbulent signal, uh, when you decompose it into fluctuation and, and a mean, the fluctuations are not necessarily proper eddies like the one you've identified. Those fluctuations can have all kinds of other structures. And I think in your slide number seven, if you can go to that slide seven, yeah, in that beautiful picture, we, we do see some eddies there and there, but we do see filaments, we see meanders and all kinds of very complex structure that I think in the Reynolds decomposition, you would get all of those small scale features but in your study, you, you really have a fixation for eddies. You only look at the contribution of eddies. So are we talking about the same thing? When, when you actually study your eddies, the one that are really round and with circular motion, is, is that the total contribution that it makes to, to what you're studying, to the fluxes? What about all those other features? Um, no, so of course, it's not the total contribution. Uh, it's the contribution of the, of the, the eddies. And yeah, usually, like in the other studies, what they call eddies, if it's just a deviation from a mean, so the Reynolds decomposition, it includes all these uh, meanders and filaments and basically everything that's not 
the, the temporal mean. Um, so of course, uh, the eddies that I look uh, at is not it's not the same thing. Okay. Um, so, so it's, this, it's not uh, we're not comparing exactly the same thing. When we talk in the ocean ocean modeling about eddy diffusion, eddy diffusivity that we those numbers, those parameters we we use in models, we don't really talk about necessarily proper eddies. We talk about all those fluctuations that contribute to some turbulent diffusion. And but in your case, okay, so that clarifies thing because I was a little lost in in the in the terminology maybe between what we call an eddy diffusion or and your eddy that you really study individual uh, eddies. Yes. So I guess one of the assumptions behind that is to say, okay, the eddies, like the real eddies, the circular features or more or less circular features, yeah. the, what separates them from, from these meanders and filaments um, in a tracer transport kind of view is that usually they, they are able to trap some water and transport it somewhere else. And this water in the core has little exchange with the surroundings. While if I have some meanders and filaments, I'm sure they're important too, but they, they are not able to trap water in this kind of way. So to, to shield some water and let's say transport uh, water with a lot of carbon to a region where usually the water does not have uh, a lot of carbon. So that, I guess, mostly these really vortices close to eddies can do that um so that is the motivation to look at the eddies to, to really um due to their advective properties of being able yes. to carry water around the more like if, if there's like meanders and filaments and just deviations from the mean often it's it creates a lot of diffusion a lot of mixing but it's it's more local it happens wherever you create your your turbulence and then the okay. eddy really can transfer something somewhere else. Okay, thank you. I really enjoyed your presentation. Actually, one of my students who's listening, Jérôme, uh, sent me an email while you were talking because he's also looking at uh, eddies in the, in the Saguenay Fjord in a much, much smaller system. But yeah. uh, we uh, really liked your uh, idea of a way of uh, using strain and vorticity to isolate um, eddies, and we uh, may uh, apply that. So thank you. Thanks for your presentation. Yeah. Thank you. If you have uh, any questions, write me an email. Great. Merci beaucoup, Yann. Thank you very much for your nice presentation. Uh, merci à tous d'avoir assisté en personne puis en ligne à, à notre webinaire. Uh, je vous retrouve le 18 janvier pour notre prochain webinaire Québec-Océan. Thank you so much. Bye. Merci. merci. Bye.